So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second uh, lecture in, in our mini school on geometric uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, I don't need to introduce the speaker anymore. You, you had an ample opportunity last week to, to, to meet him. Uh, so Fabio, um, if you are ready, <laughs> we don't mm -hmm. need to waste precious time. Uh, you're welcome to, to share your screen uh, and, start your, and start your presentation. And, and as um, usual, to the participants, please uh, don't be shy, make use of the Q&A or raise your hand and we will give you the, 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 the right to, 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 to speak. Yeah, no problem. So thank you very much, Fabio, for being with us again. And we are very much looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Um, so just a quick check, you can see the, the iPad. Uh, yes, sorry, sorry, I already muted myself. Yes, yes, we can see it. All right, yeah. perfect. All right, so thank you all for, for joining. Um, so uh, today I'm gonna be uh, a bit quicker and kind of spend a bit more time on, on technical stuff uh, because I, I've been trying to design this, this four-part school so that kind of the first lecture is an invitation, the second lecture is more about uh, the math so we'll, we'll get some of the math out of the way today. And so that in the next couple of lectures, we can, we can focus more on the, you know, some nice, uh, interesting physical cases. All right, so let me begin with a really quick recap of what we did in, in lecture one, which was just an invitation. And then uh, I'm, I'm gonna cover some of the basic, um, basics of, of geometric quantum mechanics, or at least, you know, the geometric aspects of quantum mechanics. Um, so in lecture one, uh, what, what we did was basically um, we started to explore the geometry of the quantum state space. And as we, as many of you know by this time, the simplest uh, example for a quantum state is that of a, of a qubit, which is a two-level system. If we use, uh, you know, the usual um, uh, sigma z eigenstates um, as our basis. We have the usual parameterization plus sine theta over two e to the i phi one. And theta and phi are two angles that cover uh, the whole sphere. And this is basically the geometry that you get. So this angle here is theta. And if you fix a reference frame like this, then uh, this angle here is phi. So this is the simplex example, but um, as I've um, discussed, you can, you know, uh, as uh, this is uh, differential geometry, you can have, uh, you can change coordinate and instead of using theta and phi, you can use the so-called probability and phase uh, coordinates where uh, basically the mapping is given by, uh, actually let me write it like this, sine theta over two equal square root of P. Uh, and P is just the probability that if I make a measurement um, on, um, on the eigenvector one, um, I get, uh, if I make a measurement on uh, of sigma Z, I get the value one with a certain probability P. And I have, argue that you know we can visualize this as block square and this is actually very nice because if zero and one are the eigenstates of some Hamiltonian right e0 zero, zero h1 is e1 one then the evolution is simply a translation along the phi uh, and this is because in this case p is a constant of motion p of t is equal to p of zero and phi of t is equal to phi of zero uh, minus e1 minus e0 divided by h bar uh, t. All right, so and the trajectory, this is basically, you know, it's a point moving in, in this direction. Now, one of the interesting things um, that I, I want to convey last week is that uh, this, um, the geometry of this evolution is actually codified by uh, Hamilton's equation of motion. So that uh, in principle, right, th this is governed by um, Schrodinger's equation, h bar d psi over dt is equal to h psi. But if we take, you know, given the P phi parameterization, 
I can compute the expedition value of the Hamiltonian on a general point P5. And if I use uh, coordinates where um, zero and one are the eigenstates of the, of the Hamiltonian, like in here, this is simply um, given by E0 plus um, E1 minus E0 P. Um, and you can check that if you think about this as a classical Hamiltonian, uh, then basically the, the, the evolution equation um, are, uh, the, the, the geometry of the evolution is given by Hamilton's equation of motion, right? Where um, you have P dot is equal to D uh, H of P phi over T phi and phi dot is, well, the, the one over H bar, minus one over H bar, um, D H over uh, D P. And, uh, you know, as you can see in this case, P dot is, is equal to zero and phi dot is equal to minus E1 minus E0 divided by H bar. So, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, this result is actually uh, general uh, in the sense that this is the geometry of the, um, of the unitary dynamic is, you know, it doesn't depend on the fact that we are in 2D, uh, but it, it's just a feature of, um, of, um, of the Schrodinger's equation and of the fact that when you coordinatize your, uh, your quantum state space in the appropriate way, then this becomes particularly simple, right? This is like, um, th these couple of equations are very much like uh, the so-called action angle coordinates in, um, of classical mechanics where, you know, when, in, and when you write the, evolution in these coordinates, the, the, the evolution is, is actually very, very simple. Um, oh, let me remind you again, as Francesco did at the beginning, please do ask questions, interrupt me. This is, uh, I, I want to be, uh, I want this to be as interactive uh, as possible. So, you know, don't be shy, don't, don't worry about uh, questions. Um, all right, um, yeah, Camille. Yeah, no, I have actually one question. So, uh, can you recover the same, uh, so the same relation uh, if instead of using p and phi as parameter, you use, uh, for instance, theta and phi? So the the geometry of the evolution is the same, right? So the point is that if you use theta and phi, uh, then you know this becomes you know, um, let me call it E of P phi, right? Was E zero plus E one minus E zero P, but P is just sine theta squared, uh, sine theta over two squared. So E of theta phi is just gonna depend on sine theta um, over two. And yeah, the relation, sorry, the relation is, exactly the same uh, but obviously the equation of the equations of motion will look different but you're still going to get um, this kind of structure in the sense that if I have a general and this is actually uh, you know one of the uh, of the points that I'm going to cover in more detail now the point is that there is in this space there is a notion of Poisson bracket a B that is built in a certain way that I'm, I'm, I'm gonna cover now. And therefore, you know, if um, a unitary evolution for any function f of the state space, uh, f dot for a unitary evolution is gonna be f plus some bracket with h. And so this is, uh, you know, the, the convenience of this kind of formulation is that you don't talk about coordinates and you realize that this is true in a general coordinate system. Okay, all right. all right. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, all right, so uh, let, let's actually uh, have a look at how uh, uh, this happens. Before we do that, um, so this actually, let me do it in, in a mixed way. So in mathematicians um, have discovered that, uh, sorry, have discovered the following. Given a generic um, Hilbert space of dimension D, D equal dimension of H, 
my general state is written in the following, zero to D minus one, Z alpha, E alpha, and E alpha is some, some reference basis that I use in my Hilbert space. Then the actual quantum state space is the so-called projective Hilbert space, which is Z up to multiplication for uh, a complex quantity. Lambda belongs to the complex number, but it's obviously not uh, not zero. And this, uh, as I you know hinted at uh, last week, uh, this basically uh, covers the fact that if I multiply my my uh, cat for uh, an arbitrary complex number, the vector does change, but the physical situation does not change. And so what you do in the, uh, is basically you gauge away uh, this freedom that you have. And um, this allows you to recover the full uh, quantum state space. And this has a certain structure. This is isomorphic to the complex projective space of dimension n, where n is equal to d minus 1. And the way the complex projective spaces are defined is exactly in, in this way. Now, and this is uh, very, very important uh, because it, it's actually one of the major points of geometric quantum mechanics. So complex projective spaces have two notions of geometry that are kind of intertwined with each other. The first one is Riemannian. Riemannian. And Riemannian geometry has to do with the fact that we are allowed to define um, a metric. A metric is something that allows us to compute um, distances between points, uh, the you know surface areas or volumes and so on and so forth in in higher dimension. Uh, so this is Riemannian geometry. But there's also another notion that it's um, that it's still you know there is a, another geometric structure that is present in in this space, and it's a symplectic structure. Symplectic. Structure and symplectic structures are the hallmark of phase spaces, right? When when we have uh, the, they are in, you know in classical mechanics, uh, they are the Poisson bracket, or uh, you know if you use differential geometry, uh, they're due to the fact that you can define a so-called symplectic two form. But the idea is that there is what we in in classical mechanics usually identify with this, right? In classical mechanics, this is dA over dx, dB over dP, where x and p are momentum, are position and momentum, uh, minus the other one, dA over dP, dB over dx. Um, so, so spaces that have both of these structures are called, some spaces that have both of these structures are color spaces. And um, the complex projective space of finite dimension n is a color space. And in, in mathematical terms, what that means is that basically there is a function k uh, of z and z bar, such that from this unique scalar function, you can derive uh, a notion of metric, which again, it, it's the fundamental structure for Riemannian geometry and a notion of symplectic structure. Now, these two things have to be, uh, the, the, the metric has to be symmetric and while the, the, um, the symplectic structure has to be anti-symmetric, uh, but the way you define it, it's in the following way. Uh, I have generic coordinates, right? I have um, generic complex coordinates, the alpha, Right, this one. So I can define derivatives with respect to this coordinate and you know the, the complex conjugate. So the d alpha is d over d z alpha and d alpha bar is d over d z bar. And the bar is just that so that we remember that um, we're talking about the complex conjugate. And so you have the following, the g a b bar is d a d b bar of k. And in, in our case, k is simply log of one plus z dot z bar. So, it, and you know, this sounds very, um, very mathy, uh, but uh, there, there are um, uh, 
these structures have uh, a very fundamental meaning in quantum mechanics. And the fundamental meaning is highlighted in the following relation. If I take two vectors, two, two um, Hilbert space vector, psi one and psi two, and I perform the scalar product, we know, you know, there's a, this is, uh, they live in a Hilbert space, so we know uh, that we can build a scalar product. Then I can, this scalar product is complex in general, and I de can decompose it into two parts, the real and the imaginary part. And the beautiful thing that you can prove is that this part, the real part, which is, which is uh, inherently symmetric because it's obviously, you know, psi one scalar psi two uh, plus the complex conjugate divided by two. This is the metric. This is the so-called Fubini studio metric. And it's the quantity that allows us to define, again, notions of distances, areas, volumes, volumes, and so on and so forth. And this is the symplectic structure. The symplectic structure. So it, the reason why we have both of this structure is has to do with the fact that in quantum mechanics, basically, we need to use complex numbers. And the fact that we need to use complex numbers is, is just you know, the, 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 the flip side of it is that the reason why we need to use um, complex numbers is because complex numbers inherently carry two aspects of it, right? The real and the imaginary part. And when we mix things in, in the right way, what we realize is that the need for both of these structure is because the, the, the actual state space of quantum system needs both of these structure to occur. It needs a it needs notion of Riemannian metric and it needs a notion of symplectic structure. Uh, now, before I go into the actual um, details of you know, how you build this, for example, in the simple case of, um, of a qubit, which might not be, um, you know, the, the technical details might not be super interesting for the physics of it, uh, I want to discuss the uh, statistical interpretation of the Fubini study metric and the notion of Fubini study distance. Uh, first of all, because uh, this is relevant to a question that was asked um, last week in, in, in our lecture about, you know, what is the actual geometry of, uh, of the state space, right? There was a question about if these are P and phi coordinates, how do I map this into a sphere, right? There is a non-trivial transformation, which is telling me that uh, the notion of the distance between these two points, for example, might not be the same as the distance between these two points, right? And so that means <clears throat> that this space has, um, well, it, th that it's not flat, right? So that there is a notion of distance that does depend on where you are. Um, and this is true. And, and, and so we'll, we'll, we'll now look at, look at, at some of the details of, um, of what it means to have this notion on, um, on quantum systems. So the way the, the standard way we build distances on, um, uh, on quantum systems is related to the scalar product and to um, the notion of uh, transition probability, right? If I have a state psi and a state phi, psi phi modulus square is interpreted as either the probability that if I'm in phi and I make a measurement uh, that has psi as eigenstate, there is a certain probability p of, trend of going from phi uh, to psi. So that if I'm in phi, there's a certain probability that upon a measurement, I find psi, and this is given by uh, psi phi square. And this is obviously, um, this is obviously symmetric. Um, you know, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't depend which state you start, you arrive at, it's, it's symmetric in, in the two. Now, how is this, uh, you know, geometrically and, and physically um, interpreted? And the construction goes as follows. Take my, this is the first state, right? And I have um, some alpha, and this is the square root of P alpha e to the i 
phi alpha, E alpha, right? This is just a decomposition in, 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 in one basis. And I do the same for my state uh, phi, square root of, let me call it Q alpha, E to the I, um, the other phi alpha, E alpha. And we do know that, you know, the statistical interpretation that comes from psi psi being equal to one means that sum over alpha of square root of P alpha squared is equal to the sum over alpha square root of Q alpha squared, and it's equal to one. And I'm using, you know, obviously I'm using square roots so that this looks like um, the equation for a sphere. And, the reason why this is useful is because, um, first of all, in, in, in 2D, the way we build distances is in the following way, is through the notion of geodesics, right? So if I have two points on a sphere, there is a, there's a unique, um, well, there is a preferred way in which I can measure um, distances be between these two points. And it's basically by measuring the length of the path that I have to cover uh, in order to go from point A to point B. And obviously I can, you know, I can not take this path, I can take this path, and I still end up in, in, um, in B. But obviously the length of this, let me call this L, A, B tilde, it's larger than you know the other one that I that I draw, L A B. And among all these possible paths that begin in A and end in B, there is one that is the minimum one. And this is how I measure my notion of distance. And there is one additional step, right? So the way this is quantified, it's in the following way, it, at least in 3D. Let me erase this convenience is that if I draw a ray from the center of the sphere to, um, to the two points, I can compute the angle. There's a plane um, that, that goes through these two, um, these two lines. And I can compute this angle. And the way, so I, what I do is that I define, well, what it's done is that um, LAB is, cosine is defined as cosine of theta, which means that the notion of uh, distance, the appropriate notion of distance, DAB, DAB is basically uh, R cosine of LAB. So this is the way the notion of Fubini studi uh, distance, and so this is done in, on the block sphere, so it, it can be carry it carries through um, to the Hilbert space of dimension two. But it, there is a generalization uh, in in higher dimensions, and uh, it, it works exactly in the same way. And the way this is practically done is that um, uh, there is uh, there is a notion of distance that we can use for classical probability distribution. If I have a probability distribution, you know, P alpha and another one, Q alpha, there is a notion that I can build of distance between these two that basically uses the same kind of argument. And this is called the uh, Bhattacharya uh, distance. And it's given by cosine of the distance between these two classical, let me call it classical probability distribution which is um, with sum over uh, this is alpha, square root of P alpha, square root of Q alpha, right? But obviously um, in quantum mechanics, we don't just have this part, right? Uh, we also have the faces, this face is here. And so what you can prove is that um, for these two states, you can compute um, you can compute the, you, you can prove the, the following, uh, that the following is true, that the sum over alpha of psi e alpha modulus phi e alpha modulus is larger than psi phi modulus. 
So basically, what I what I do is that I take the composition, an arbitrary decomposition, an arbitrary basis, and this decomposition gives me uh, probabilities and faces. So what I do is that I compute the classical distance between the probability parts of this um, of these two states, but then obviously then I can change. Um, um, I can basically change my either my parameterization, uh, and and uh, I'm gonna get um, a slightly different results. What I do is that I span across all the possible um, parameterization that I can find, and I realize that again exactly for these reasons because there is a you know there's a compact geometry there. Um, there is a um, uh, there's a minimum, and this minimum is given by the modulus of the scalar product between, between these two vectors. And the reason is because uh, the optimal way of, um, of choosing this decomposition is by taking as a reference state phi, and then coming up with a basis that involves phi as vector zero, and then basically finding the set of vectors that are in the orthogonal space of this and so uh, I, I build the basis out of it and so there is uh, this gives me basically um, um, this results. Um, so this is the Fubini studio distance when I when I identify this with cosine of Fubini studio um, Fubini studio distance and so you can you know in, in this is not written in terms of projective invariance because we're just um, using the standard Hilbert space notation but the way uh, this is built is in in terms of the projective Hilbert space um, is that um, cosine of d Fubini studio square is defined as um, Psi phi module square divided by psi psi phi phi. And you can see that basically with this form, if I multiply phi uh, or psi by uh, you know some some complex number, uh, that you know uh, nothing changes, right? So this quantity is um, is left invariant. Um, now and and this is um, this is actually very uh, very important. The um, I mentioned it uh, at the beginning. What is the interpretation <clears throat> of of this um, of this notion of distance? And there is a very nice. Um, this result is actually more general, but um, I'll I'll mention it uh, briefly here. Uh, what this means is that. Um, uh, if I want to be able to distinguish, you know, the, 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 the notion, the relevant notion here is that of distinguishability of classical probability distribution at the classical level, and then this thing carries through for quantum states. It's about distinguishability of quantum states. So what this quantity is telling us is that the notion of distance that we have on the quantum state space has to do with the full uh, with the ability that we have to distinguish two quantum states. So, and what that means is that if I have orthogonal states, psi, psi orthogonal, this is equal to zero, then uh, because um, there is a cosine in between, this means that the distance is maximum, d Fubini studio is pi over two. Remember the interpretation in terms of the angle. And when this happens, this means that there is full classical distinguishability. What this means is that these two, that there exists an observable that is able to fully discriminate between, uh, between these two quantum states, which means that there is a, in principle at least, there's an experimental way of, um, of being able to tell apart the physical configurations that are described by Psi and, and by uh, Psi. By orthogonal, you know, by a quantum state and and uh, and other states that it's orthogonal orthogonal to it. Um, when you know, in in between, you have situations where there is not complete distinguishability, and you know, this thing fades away as the angle uh, as the angle closes. But and this is very important. This is the fundamental notion of distance in quantum state space. So the actual notion, which is something that is absent 
in classical mechanics, right? I've in lecture one, I've emphasized how the geometry of the evolution and the geometry of the quantum state space, uh, it's actually very similar to the, um, the geometry of a classical phase space. While this is true for the symplectic part in the sense that there are, there is a, a, I argue that there is a symplectic structure and which means that you can define a notion of Poisson bracket. Um, this is actually not true for the notion of distance. And we know that because uh, in, in classical phase space in principle, there is no preferred notion of distance, right? Uh, we can we can use Euclidean distances, or you, we can use different notion of distances, and it, it wouldn't matter. We can we have the ability to choose, right? Because there is no preferred one. In this case, there is a fundamental notion of distance that is given by the Fubini study distance, and it determines the fundamental geometry of the quantum state space. Now, this is not perfect in the sense that um, it's it it gives the basic building structure of the quantum state space, but it has itself some problems. And I'm just gonna mention uh, one, um, and that becomes, uh, that becomes evident to, to any experimentalist, um, and it has to do with the many body structure. So imagine that you're trying to measure energies of the uh, hydrogen atom, right? And so, you know, no, why is it not? Sorry. So the I have a bunch of levels. Let's say that this is the, the, the ground state, E0. And then I have E n and uh, some E n plus one. Now, because of a theorem in quantum mechanics, uh, the, the Hamiltonian of the hydrogen atom is um, um, the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, and because of a theorem in quantum mechanics, the eigenvectors of a Hermitian operator are orthogonal to each other. This means, right, E n E k is equal to delta n k. Now, what we learn, right, is that this means that the Fubini study distance between the eigenvector E n and the eigenvector ek is maximal, right? Is pi over two, which means that they're fully, that these eigenstates are all mutually um, distinguishable. But obviously, <laughs> if I have, um, uh, if the levels become very close to each other, the experimental ability that I have of distinguishing a ground state from its first excited state, it's gonna be very, very different from my experimental ability of distinguishing, you know, the 100 state with respect to that 101 state. And you can formulate the same idea in terms of um, spin chain and, and spin Hamiltonian. If I have, um, if I have a one dimensional spin ch uh, cubic chain, where each of these things is, is a qubit, a full basis is given by you know, the spin of the first qubit, the spin of the second qubit, and so on and so forth. Now, obviously, it stands to experimental reason is that this state is going to be experimentally much closer to this than it's going to be you know, to the state with all of them are one. But according to the Fubini study distance, they all have the same distance within each other. So uh, this is, is by itself is not a problem in the sense that this is the fundamental building block of the quantum state space. But this does mean that there are additional, that we can define additional notions of distance on the quantum state space that are useful for different reasons. And you know, there are there's a plethora of them. I'm not going to cover any of them, but there is. Um, there is one for, uh, you know, you can choose uh, different ones and, and they all play, they're all physically motivated and all, they all play a role. Um, all right, so this is the Fubini to the distance. Um, and then let me really quickly go through um, um, the construction basically of, um, 
Let's do, so it's 7.36. So I want to cover um, at least a couple of this because they're physically interesting. So let me just um, go quickly to, um, to the notion of, uh, of volume. So as I argued uh, at the beginning, uh, you know, mathematically, these complex projective spaces are color spaces, which means that they have two notions of geometry, Riemannian and, and symplectic structure. And you can, the, the formal way in which this is defined, it's in the following way. And I'm just going to mention it and, and we're going to build one of this is that G A, actually, let me change. So G A B bar is d a d b bar k where k is uh, log of one plus z dot z bar and um, right obviously if you if we look at g as a matrix this is actually block of diagonal g a b bar g um, a b bar star and this is a zero, right? So what this means is that in principle, I, I can contract, you know, uh, ZA with itself with ZB, but these contractions are just not present because of the way the notion, because of the way the metric, uh, the Fubini's 2D metric is, right? Uh, but I'm mostly, because of this, because of the fact that there is a unique fundamental block, I'm just gonna refer to this as well as the Fubini study metric itself. Uh, now, whenever you have this, um, uh, you're in a color space, you can basically do the following trick uh, where you can define uh, omega, which is a two form as two I G A B bar, Z A wedge Z bar B bar. And the wedge product here, uh, just, you know, for um, physical, uh, to, to have a physical model in mind um, is, exactly the same this is called the exterior algebra and uh, the uh, the idea is the same as the one that we have in 3d right if in 3d if i have x and y i can do if i have x y and z i can do the wedge product of x and y and i get a vector along z and this is the way for example we build um, uh, vectors which um, area vectors right if, if i have a surface and I want to know what, what is the, the, uh, the vector that it's orthogonal, that it's exiting basically the surface that it, in, in a way that this vector describes the direction in which the surface is looking. Uh, this is what I have to do. I, I use the wedge product locally and I do uh, basically with the, um, with the rule of the right hand, I do X, Y and I get Z. And it's the same, it's exactly, um, it's exactly the same concept. Uh, and now this defines uh, a matrix with the following identity, omega ij, xi wedge xj. And so this means that, you know, I can define this matrix omega ij for the coordinates xi, for any coordinate xi and uh, xj. And omega ij is, is anti-symmetric minus omega ij uh, and you can build the inverse and you can show that basically um, for um, for any vector in um, in a tangent space basically there is a vector field where um, you know if i have um, if this is my manifold i have a point in here and actually let me do it on the sphere easy. This is the sphere with a point in here. I draw basically the manifold that it's tangent to the sphere. And this is the way we uh, geometrically can describe the space of derivatives. It's going to be 2D. So there's going to be, um, there's going to be a basis. And so the way uh, for an arbitrary direction that is given by a vector VI, uh, the, the, the vector field is going to be um, defined by omega i j d j for of some uh, some function. Let me call it e. Um, and so, whenever you have these kinds of um, 
geometric constructions for vector field and you're in a color space, um, because you are you have this quantity that it's fundamental, it's a, it's a structural quantity of the, the that has to do with the fundamental structure of your uh, of your state space. You can build Poisson brackets basically in in contracting things in the following way. So a b then it's defined as d i a omega i j d j b. And so, for example, in in um, um, once this is defined. Oh, sorry. Once this is defined, you can compute G. From G, you compute omega. And from omega, you build your notion of Poisson bracket. So, and this goes back to, um, you know, Kamel's question of whether this notion of uh, Hamilton's equation of motion uh, just carries through uh, in, in arbitrary coordinate system, or it's just a feature of you know, a specific situation. And the reason why this is absolutely completely general and has nothing to do with you know, um, semi-classical um, uh, you know, H bar going to zero or um, even um, any choice of a coordinate system, um, that's, this is the actual, this is the reason. Uh, is because there is a fundamental anti-symmetric um, form that, it, that it plays the role of a symplectic to form from which you can define the Poisson bracket. And so, for example, in, in P phi coordinates, uh, this um, assume a very simple form, which is this. And so um, what you can see is that uh, when you put this um, um, in in here, and you have uh, d0a, you call it, and this is dp, a, and then d1a is d5, then what you have is that da, db is basically da, dp, db, d5, minus da, d5, db, dp. And so this structure just carries through uh, for, um, uh, yeah, in, in, in general, um, Hilbert spaces. All right. Um, we covered the existence of um, symplectic to form. And this is, you know, the existence of this structure is, again, is the hallmark of phase space, of classical phase spaces. Uh, and is, uh, you know, one of the, uh, major reasons why um, uh, you can prove, for example, that you know, Schrodinger's equation amounts to Hamilton's equation of motion and why you can think about the quantum state space as a classical phase space, but with, the notion, with a specific notion of, um, of distance on it. Now, this kind of covers the, the symplectic aspect, uh, but obviously this is highly interconnected with, uh, um, with the Riemannian aspect. And one of the ways in which you can see that these two notions of geometry are compatible with each other is that Riemannian geometry allows us to define a unique notion of volume. And this is given by, uh, you know, through the rules of differential geometry, this is given by the Fubini studi volume element, which is defined as the square root of the determinant of the Fubini studi metric times the Lebesgue matrix, which is the, you know, the, the, the product of uh, DZ of uh, Z bar. Now, as we know, you know, studying classical statistical mechanics, um, there we also have a fundamental notion of volume, right? In, in X and P in classical statistical mechanics, if I have N particles, for example, in three dimension, the way I do it is that there's a product over the number of particles, there is a product over x, y, and z, and I do dx, i, alpha, d, p, i, alpha, right? This is the, the uh, d, v in, uh, in phase space. Now, you can show that, um, and this is, again, about the compatibility of these two notions of geometry with each other. You can show that uh, you, the, the way you, you can build this 
Um, because this is obviously built out of the simplectic to form we have in classical phase space, you can show that you can build a notion of volume uh, using the symplectic to form. And the way this is done, let me call one, two, Fubini Studi. The way this is done is that, and let me remember the convention, there's a one over n factorial, yes, this omega over two, and then you wedge omega over two, where omega is the symplectic structure, you wedge it a number of times n, and you get a form that has, basically you can prove that dVs1 equal dV2, uh, DV Fubini Studi. So up to obviously an overall scale factor that I can always um, um, fix however I want to. Um, they give you exactly the same volume form, which means that there is a unique notion of phase space volume, which means that there is a unique way, there is a preferred way to set up integrals, right? This is why um, <clears throat> practically um, we use a lot this volume form in, in classical statistical mechanics is to perform integrals, compute partition functions, you know, ensembles, uh, and all of that. And if you're wondering um, how this is practically done, um, you, well, it, this is done in the following way. So the, the naive way in which we build volume forms, right, is through the Lebesgue measure, right? We have a coordinate system, Z and Z bar, and you would just compute the Lebesgue measure DZ over DZ bar. The problem is that this quantity here, it's not an invariant. So if I change coordinate system, this changes phase, right? Which means that if I have a scalar function and I compute the integral fz dz dz bar, if I change my coordinate system, and let me call this big Y, the Y bar, I'm gonna get a different answer. This is a problem because that means the, the fact that this quantity is unique raises the question of the fact that there is a, a preferred, whether there is a preferred coordinate system, you know, how do I compute integral? Is there, a, you know, do I need to use one and only one coordinate system? This is obviously not nice. So the way this is handled in differential geometry is that you need to find invariant um, volume forms, which are invariant under coordinate change. And this, is exactly uh, the way um, the Fubini Studi um, uh, notion of um, of volume is built, and you can the reason why um, it's built in this way is that you can prove that um, upon a coordinate change, this transforms with the determinant of the Jacobian, and the Jacobian. Uh, you know, in general, of a, of a transformation, if I have some coordinate xi to yi, uh, the Jacobian of the um, of the transformation is the uh, is the matrix j i j is the matrix of derivatives xi d y j. And <clears throat> excuse me, and you can show that. Um, because of this, you know, the, um, let me call it Z tilde, the Z tilde bar, you can show that the determinant of G transforms in the opposite way. The determinant of G goes, when I change coordinate system, goes to one of the determinant of J, determinant of G tilde, which means that the quantity, um, uh, sorry, square root, that the quantity, square root of determinant of G, dz, dz bar, it's invariant. Square root of determinant of G tilde, dz tilde, dz bar tilde. Does not depend on the coordinate system that I use to compute stuff, which means that if I have a scalar function, f of z, I can do, and let me call it dv for b studi, in the coordinate system z, this is equal to f z tilde dv Fubini studi z tilde. And now, you know, things don't depend, the, the result of this integral does not depend on, on uh, the way 
I compute the integral does not depend on the coordinate system. And I, I should actually mention as well that um, this quantity is unitarily invariant as things should be in, in quantum mechanics. Sorry, Fabio. Can I let John ask a question? Sure thing, yeah. Hi, um, it's been a while since I've looked at the, these exterior algebras, but if I remember correctly, the exterior product is anti-commutative. So why is it fine that we have the omega outer product omega and it's not just trivially zero? Uh, what do you mean here? Uh, here? Uh, yes. So this is a high dimensional thing, right? So basically, um, Let's take, so your argument is true. If I take this form and I compute one more wedge product, because by the fact that, the, so let me do it explicitly, right? So for N equal to one, this is just DP wedge D phi, right? So there is nothing else. So if I were to <coughs> wedge it with something else, then yes, that something else is either going to be dp or d phi, and then I'm going to get something zero. But in general, the full thing is going to be uh, dp1 wedge d phi1, wedge dp2 wedge d phi2, you know? And these are probability and faces and so on and so forth. So by wedging omega with itself up to n times, where n is the dimension of the um, um, of the complex projective space. Uh, basically, you cover all the possible coordinates, but not one more. If you would add one more, one more wedge product, then you would get to zero because of the of what you just mentioned, the, the anti-symmetrization. But because you do it exactly n times, you get something that is not, um, yeah, that is not zero. Is that? Does that is that clear? Yeah, I think so. I, I at some point I just didn't click that these omegas were dp one, d phi one, and the other one would be dp two and d phi two. So they they weren't the same. Well, it's so omega. Where is it? There you go. Right. So. Uh, oh, I, I should have probably said, right? There is uh, Einstein index notation here. So there's a sum here, right? So this is sum over I and J is one alpha in front. Omega I J X I wedge X I J, right? So there is all of them, which means that the only things that are, like you said, they're not going to survive are the ones that are different from each other. How many there are? There's n, obviously, because n is the total dimension of the complex projective space. So the number of wedge product you can do without getting to zero is up to n, right? So up to n, I can do wedge product of omega with itself, and it's only going to select um, basically wedge products. Uh, they are not the same because of anti-symmetrization. When you do it exactly n time, you get a unique form. And that, that is what allows you to build uh, the volume form. Okay, now I understand also why the m factorial is there. And so the reason why yeah. this is unique in terms of sign as well is because we have the two coordinates. We have p and we have phi. Pretty much, so if we yes. swap them, it doesn't change yeah. the sign. Okay. Which is so why the P phi coordinates are so useful, right? Because they diagonalize the symplectic form. So the symplectic form becomes particularly simple in this coordinate system. And indeed, this is signaled by the fact that if I write dv Fubini's 2D in those probability phase coordinates, I get pretty much exactly the same thing that I get in classical mechanics. I get the product over uh, alpha that goes from one to n of dp alpha d phi alpha. And usually there is a factor of two in here that it's uh, for, um, for normization. But I mean, all these things are up to um, an overall constant factor. So you can disregard that or modify it with a, with a two pi for 
integral reasons. Um, yeah, so this is this is why you get this form because you're wedging omega with itself exactly um, n times. Um, all right, I think that this is actually a, a good point where to stop. Uh, I've shown you that you can define an appropriate notion of integrals. And all right, let me go back to the overview. And I did not have the chance to cover what I wanted to cover, but let me give um, a really quick overview. So we, we went through, um, in the first lectures, we, we went through, uh, it was kind of an invitation, right? So we, we explored the fact that the, the, space, the, the quantum state space of a qubit, the, the simplest finite dimensional quantum system, um, is basically like a, it works like a classical phase space. Uh, but as we argued, there is a preferred notion of distance that it's selected by the geometry itself of the quantum state space which has very well-known classical analog that has to do with the distinguishability of classical probability distribution. The way this is built is by extending this notion of classical distinguishability into quantum, uh, into quantum systems. And this gives rise to the notion of Fubini's 2D distance. Now, another way we can look at this uh, from the uh, geometry of the quantum state space is by looking at uh, what the state space is, which is the projective Elbus space, which is isomorphic to isomorphic to the complex projective space of dimension n, where n is equal to the d minus one, and this, these are color spaces, which means that they have do two notions of geometry intertwined with each other. This notion of Riemannian geometry. Uh, which has to do with, with the ability of defining a matrix, which allows you to compute distances, areas, volumes, and so on. But there's also a notion of symplectic geometry, which is given by the ability, by basically the ability of extracting an anti-symmetric two form from the same, um, from the same quantity that we use to extract um, the notion of metric. Um, and this is actually called the color potential, if you wanna, uh, if you wanna look it up. Um, so these two notions of geometry, they work together to shape, to give you the actual shape of the quantum state space. And it, as argued, this is actually, it's similar to the classical phase space because also classical phase space also have symplectic geometry. But it's also different in that there is a preferred notion of distance. So in some sense, um, and this is a quote from the book by uh, Bengtsson and Zukowski, um, in some sense, classical mechanics does not have a preferred notion of distance to preserve, while quantum mechanics does. And this is about distinguishability of the ability to distinguish two quantum configurations. Um, and uh, I've started, uh, mentioning how you do um, integrals uh, because uh, this is basically, I mean, this is preparation in order to do um, ensembles, you know, to, to deal with uncertainty on, on quantum state space, to build ensembles and to build um, situations in which I don't exactly know what the quantum state of a system is, but I have a certain probability distribution on the quantum state space and I want to explore uh, these physical situations, because most of the times we, we are in situations where, you know, the, the knowledge of the state is not exact. And, and so we need to use ensembles exactly as we do in classical statistical mechanics. Um, all right. I think this is it uh, for the technical reasons. Feel free to, to stick around if you want to ask um, some questions. And I'm, I'm happy to you know, to take any question now. Yeah, Fabio, thank you very much again for a, for a very interesting uh, lecture. I think it was really very, very useful. Yeah, and uh, so thank you so much. We had a few questions in between, but uh, please, um, all participants, uh, we can uh, give you the right to, 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 to speak. <laughs> just, just give us a signal <laughs> in the usual way. And, uh, and we will click on, uh, on, on, on allow to speak, please.
or if you have any comment or wishes for, for the future lectures or, yeah. Uh, Camille, please go ahead. Yeah, no, may, maybe, uh, uh, yeah, one question. Uh, so, so yeah, you, you showed us how we can build uh, the anti-symmetric two forms, the uh, Poisson bracket. But now I don't see uh, how this implies that, again, the Hamilton equation are uh, independent on the parametrization you use. Why, what, uh, uh, because it seems you, you said, yeah, since we can build that, it means uh, that the Hamiltonian equation will be satisfied for any parametrization. If I Say that again. Well. It looks the way you presented it is that uh, uh, since we can build a, a Poisson bracket, uh, we can show that uh, the, the uh, Hamilton uh, the equation of, of motion by, by Hamilton uh, are satisfied for any parametrization of the. So you can, if you choose the, the parameter p phi, it, it's satisfied. But if you choose any other one, it will be satisfied as well. Oh, you mean, yes, it will look different in the sense that you're going to have factors like, for example, if I use theta in, in for the qubit on the block sphere, if I use theta and phi coordinates in, instead of p and phi, I'm going to have factors like sine theta going around, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, that, that, so visually, they're going to look like different equations, right? Because I'm using different coordinate system. Mm -hmm. but the geometry of it is still the full geometry of the Hamilton's equation of motion in that it's Poisson brackets. I mean, that's the fundamental way in which uh, you define um, Hamiltonian flows is that okay. there is a scalar mm -hmm. function and the time derivative of any function under the flow given by this, uh, this generator is given by the Poisson bracket. And yeah, it's okay, the equation, okay. right? F dot equal mm -hmm. Poisson bracket F with H. That's universal and has nothing to do with coordinates. Okay, now, okay. once you want to solve those equations, you know, there's a there's probably, you know, the, the um, coordinate independent formulas is very useful conceptually, but to actually solve equations, there's nothing more useful than a specific coordinate system mm -hmm. that is well suited to respect the symmetries, right? So for example, yeah. if you use theta and phi coordinates, you know that you can map that problem into a rotation, mm -hmm. right? And then it's kind of implicitly solved because you just look at the equation and you recognize that these equations, upon choosing the right um, uh, the right axis of rotation, these are just rigid rotation of the sphere. And so the equations are solved. Now, obviously, if you try to solve the equation for a rigid rotation of the sphere along an axis to which you're not aligned, it's going to be yeah. a nightmare. You're going to have factors of theta and mm -hmm. phi hanging around, and it's going to be very, very annoying. But if you choose your coordinate system appropriately, then things are going to be um, uh, easier to solve. But that doesn't mean that they're not Hamilton's equation of motion. They're, they're still yeah, Hamilton's okay. equation of motion. I think, yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Are, are, are there further comments or questions? Please don't be shy. I think people might be tired. It's really yeah. <laughs> you, should, you should be tired. <laughs> you did all the work. Yeah. Okay, Fabio, it, it doesn't seem that uh, like there are urgent yeah. questions, which probably is a testimony that your lectures were uh, are very clear and, uh, and, and to the point. So Fabio, thank you so much uh, for pleasure. today. Um, I'm already, I see there are lots of thank yous in the, in the chat uh, of your supporters club here. And um, yeah, and we will, we will meet you again next week for, for lecture number three. Uh, do, do, would you like to give us a little preview of next week so that uh, uh, I, was, I, I was gonna I was gonna cover some um, interesting physical um, results but uh, uh, I think we'll still need um, I guess 20 minutes of um, uh, a bit of more math it's it's not um, uh, 
it's not too, you know, it's not too mathy, but what I, I think that um, it's very important at this point to connect this math with actual physical things that we know that are interesting. Like for example, uh, there's a very simple calculation you can do uh, to show what actually the time energy uncertainty principle means, right? And uh, this, like the geometric formula is, is particularly suited to understand these kinds of things. And so, uh, because sometimes you get, you know, um, quantum mechanics is founded on the linear algebra formulas, right? And so sometimes there is a question of why should I go and learn this, this uh, much more complicated formula is what do I gain? I'm not going to do it if I don't know that I actually have some practical, some, something practical to gain. And I think this, this little calculations like, you know, the, the minimum orthogonalizing time and these kinds of things, they actually make it very clear why uh, the geometric underpinning is very useful to extract some physics with very simple calculations. You don't need to go through, you know, a lot of coordinate system is actually the advantage is that with appropriate choices of your coordinate system, you avoid uh, going through the full process of solving the equations and you just get directly to the point. Uh, so I wanna give a, a, a couple of these uh, and, and then look at some, some uh, basically um, open quantum systems evolution. Excellent. Thank you very much. That uh, sounds super interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Fabio. Then uh, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for, for your interest. And um, we will send you the, the, the reminder as, as usual next week. Uh, so please um, join us again uh, uh, next week. Fabio, thank you very much. All right. We, thank we you will again. See you, we will see you next week and uh, have a good week. rest of the day because for you it was just breakfast time, I guess. <laughs> very much. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, good. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will get ready for bye. dinner. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye, Camille. Bye, Ilya. Thank you so much.